Welcome to another episode. I guess I don't know what to call these yet. They don't have titles. They're yeah, special we'll guest them. episodes. We'll think of a name. We'll do like, I don't know, the gauntlet or something. We'll figure something out. Uh, we have a new, two new faces on here, basically. Uh, McBets is on. Um, MC Betts. You can call him Mike. Whatever. Whatever. Um, everything Move goes up. on. Uh, he's He comes on every now and then, but he's on this for a great play. You know, we're going to let Austin take a breather. Let Mike come on. And we do have a, a nice guest a little below. Jensen Lewis, a former Cleveland Indians reliever, current Valley Sports, Great Lakes, Guardians Live analyst, and MLB Network radio host. Jensen Lewis, that is not your at. We're going to fix that and put it in the description. <laughs> How are you doing today? Thank you for coming by. Uh, guys, great to be with you, and uh, a Merry Christmas Eve, right? Uh, I know we're, we're taping this before uh, we, we get to, to opening day, but, uh, man, it's uh, it feels like uh, this is uh, one of those times where, as sports fans, you always look to it. I know uh, for us, it, it usually was Super Bowl weekend, which was also when I lived in Arizona, uh, when they had the waste management open. And that was kind of our last weekend before spring training really got going in earnest that, OK, it's game time. It's time to really focus on the year. And then uh, either we were already in that first weekend of the regular season when the final four started, the national championship game started for March Madness. And I was like, okay, now everyone gets to focus on us. It's baseball season, but uh, excited to be with you guys and uh, looking forward to a great show. Yeah. I'm awesome. glad to have you on Mike. How are you feeling today? Great. Great. Couldn't be happier. The guardians last year were one of my favorite offenses to bet on. Maddie would celebrate uh, lefty versus pirates day from a, a pitching <laughs> perspective. I would celebrate righty versus guardians day from a hitting perspective you know Quan lefty ramirez lefty uh nyler lefty home run props total bases all that home run, uh maybe sgps with the guardians lineup there against the righty so that was always fun so we we're gonna talk about some props here today and uh just overall the outlook uh for the guardians for the season yeah it's yeah I, I will say I'm going to get in here. I love the Guardians. I know you have to say you like the Guardians. I think they're a great team. Um, you're going to unbiased side over here. I, I'm all in on Cleveland. Um, do you have to say it, or do you, are you allowed to have doubts? Oh, you absolutely, guys. And and I'll go go back to my rookie year in 2007. You know when we went on to win uh, the Central Division. It was supposed to be the Detroit Tigers that year with Justin Verlander and um, you know a host of great hitters and Miguel Cabrera. Um, you know, Carlos Guillen, there were, there were so many great offensive guys that Detroit had, and we really caught fire uh, the second half of that season. And, and much in the same way that the guardians last year were really able to solidify that division title. Uh, we did uh, sort of the same thing and then defied a lot of odds going into Yankee stadium and beating the Yankees, a cool, fun trivia fact for you guys. Uh, I'm part of the last team ever, no matter if it's home or away to win a postseason series in the old Yankee stadium. Cause if you guys remember, they missed the playoffs in 2008. Yeah. Yeah. The new stadium yeah. came up in 2009, which we opened uh, And another fun trivia. Uh, I am the first ever losing pitcher from an away team in new Yankee stadium. So we had the good, and we have the bad. So we get that out of the way, but uh, cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, you it, are, you it, are it, the it, answer it, to a jeopardy. Like, Question. You need a little a little beer money before uh, guys go out at night. There, there's your trivia to, to yes. stump everybody. But yeah, it, I, this team last year, guys, was really fun to watch. I, I think they really embodied uh, just that that young, that rugged. Hey, we're we're we may not be smart enough to realize what we're doing. We're just playing the game because this is all we know how to do. And to have guys like Jose Ramirez and Shane Bieber, uh, veterans that have been around and, and kind of understood what was happening to help lead them uh, through that second half and into the playoffs. They were fun. I mean, the most come from behind victories in all of Major League Baseball last year. Like if you left progressive field in the seventh or eighth inning, shame on you because likely something crazy was going to happen uh, in the Guardians' favor by the time it was all said and done. Uh, a, a back into the bullpen with arguably the best closer in the league in Emmanuel Classe, and then knowing that you've got an MVP candidate each year in J Ram uh, that that started out the year, if you remember, and I'm sure you guys do from the wagering side. I mean, he was on pace for like 170 RBIs. He was almost automatic <laughs> driving a run, you know, nearly every night. So uh, they return a lot of the same guys. You get, you know, Josh Bell coming in, who was the big signing, He's free huge. agent wise. 
Mike Zanino as catcher. You know, it's been a struggle offensively for this group the last couple of years to get some offense out of the catching position. But I think their lineup is a lot deeper this year. And they just had the extension now with Andre Semenez. Largest pre-arbitration extension for a second baseman ever. And if you were to say it was the Cleveland Guardians that would do that, yeah. I think people would be like, well, that's that's kind of nutty right there. So I, I think you understand kind of where their, their bread is buttered now with a great young core offensively, a great pitching staff. And now it's the difference of being the hunt did this year instead of being the hunters. They're not going to sneak up on anybody. And I'll go back to my, my rookie year in 07 going into 2008. We got everybody's best bullet that year. And, and that's where I think they're going to have maybe a little bit of a learning curve is night in yeah. and night out, you're going to get everybody's best effort, and it's way different from what they had last year. Yeah, I, I, I think going from that, like uh, you may be right where they were almost like a surprise. Like if you end the, end the series here, they may, they may save their ace or, or they may play their ace in that game and not, you know, not go with their top guys versus the Guardians. But now, you know, their, I guess, respect was earned. And it's just as just just as hard to be good and maintain being good than it is to have that one off surprise year. I love the the core. I know, like I loved Ahmed Rosario. I'm a Mets fan, if you can tell by all my stuff back there. Um, Jimenez, I love too. Um, I know we needed to get Lindor, so I say thank you for Lindor. You could probably say thank you for these young bloods over there as well. Um, nice little happy marriage we kind of had there. Um, but. I think Josh Bell, you need to get the twins made a lot of good moves as well. So I think you kind of needed to make sure you stayed above. Um, but like like Mike said before, it's a fun team to bet on, a fun team to watch yeah. um, from pitching perspective and at the plate. So you you're lucky enough to where you don't have to, you know, you're not bored ever over in that booth. Yeah, yeah and, be- and honestly, yeah, Maddie, I, I and I'm sorry, Mikey, I, I think there's no, totally. two things that come out of that is you know. First and foremost, it, it it's a group that can beat you in different ways. And maybe with the rule changes this year, other teams are going to have sort of that onboarding process. It's like Cleveland kind of had a year ahead of everybody last year because that's all, that's all they could really do was they had to put the ball in play a ton. They had to take the extra base. They had to try steal bases. They had to manufacture more runs, and they had to play really solid defense and pitch really well. So I think the rest of the league – they may have a leg up on maybe the first month or two. Um, and, you know, I, I think about this from, you know, a betting perspective too. You think about, you know, first five totals. You think about, you know, guys, at least props, if you want to put SGPs together of, you know, stolen bases or, you know, being able to, to have, uh, you know, total bases in there. You've got a lot of opportunities because they, they don't strike out a lot. They were one of the lowest strikeout percentages in all of big league baseball last year. So it, it kind of gives you an embarrassment of riches there if you want to plug guys in to know that, you know, for three or four at bats, especially at the top, you know, with Kwani, uh, with Ahmed, as you talked about, Maddie, and then of course with Jose from both sides of the plate, really high percentages for them to really pay off. So kind of tying into <clears throat> gambling and a little bit like with futures. Odds on favorite to repeat as AL Central champs. They won the division by 11 games last year. Do you see anybody else making that much of a difference in the offseason to catch Cleveland, being that they won, they did win the division by double digit, by double digit games? Yeah, I, I think this is, Mikey, honestly, the, the American League Central has is, is kind of been a round robin, it feels like, the last five to 10 years. And uh, whether it's Minnesota, whether it's the White Sox, uh, you know, heck, even Detroit you know, um, uh, even eight to 10 years ago. I mean, they, this is still a division where if you win 85 games, you're, you're probably going to be, you know, in that top spot or, or, or as close to it as possible. For me, when, when you look at Minnesota, this, this off season, initially when they made the arise trade over to Miami for Pablo Lopez, I kind of threw my hands up in the air, like, Whoa, you trade yeah. the batting champion for, yeah. You know, a, a guy that and, – and, hey, I full disclosure, I had Pablo Lopez on my fantasy team last year. And the first two months of the season, I'm like, damn, I got I got one of the steals uh, of the year. I mean, this was great. Uh, he he kind of tapered off a bit in the second half, but he's he's got a great arsenal, good three-pitch mix. I think he's going to do really well in that rotation. And to me, you know, just taking the Twins, for instance, I think, I think they have to answer two questions. First is – can you get Byron Buxton 500 at bats because of all the injury history? If you can yeah. do that, and I know they're going to try and DH him a lot more this year, 
because they got Michael A. Taylor in the trade from Kansas City to play center field. Buxton is so, so versatile in that lineup when he's healthy. And to me, with him and Correa at the top, that's as good a one-two punch when both those guys are healthy as anybody in the American League. I don't think anyone is lining up to face that. It's their rotation and the impact that they can have. They don't have a bona fide ace, if you will, but they've got a lot of good like number two, number three types with Lopez, with Joe Ryan, you know, with Sonny Gray, Kenta Maeda coming back from the Tommy John. And again, we're only a couple of years removed from him finishing second to Shane Bieber in the Cy Young race in 2020. So yeah. they've got the they've got the potential. It's just a matter of what is the consistency of that rotation and can they keep Buxton healthy? I think on the Chicago side, they've got the most upside. Like if I'm looking at World Series futures in the American League right now, I think you have to circle the White Sox because they've been the sexy pick the last couple of years. They've been a team that on paper, there's plenty of talent. And, and I think everyone knows that. It's just been key injury after key injury, whether it's yeah. been Eloy Jimenez, whether it's been Tim Anderson. Remember, they didn't have Lance Lynn last year for the first month because of an injury. Lucas Giolito missed two to three starts in April. They're going to be without Liam Hendricks, unfortunately, because of the cancer issue at the beginning of this season. But for a team that, if they're right, and they can be healthy together by the All-Star break, this is a really scary team. And if, if you want to buy low on a club that's got all the talent in the world, I, I think they've got the most upside in this division, not only for the American League, but for a chance to Overall. win it all. Well, right now on, on FanDuel, Cleveland to win the World Series, plus 2,500. Minnesota, plus 3,000. Chicago White Sox, plus 3,500. Those are right yeah. in a row. They're right. that So that AL Central is, is clustered together. So obviously uh, the odds makers think – all these teams have a shot to at least make the playoffs and they're all within the same group to, to win it all. So it's, it should be a fun race for the AL Central this year. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and like I said, it might be a round robin. You might see, you know, two or three of these teams take a hold of first place throughout the season. And then once you get to the all-star break and, and really everyone has a pretty good idea of who they are and, and assessing you know what injuries they've had to deal with throughout the year, the, the trade deadline might be as important for this division race, just in the American league uh, as any that we might have. Yeah, I think you're right. I think even the Royals are a popular dark horse sleeper team to kind of be in the mix. <laughs> I'm not saying they're going to, but that's what people are liking with the young talent. Can they make the leap? Um, obviously if I'm a betting man, which I am, I'm probably not going to, but <laughs> um, that's, that's uh, the way people are kind of seeing it and going back to the rule changes and, um, the overall, you know, the shift band, the pitch clock. Um, there was actually a study done. Not sure if it's going to translate or if it's going to be 100% accurate, but someone did a metric for assessing negative or favorable rule effect dynamics, calling it the Manfred. Um, and it's like pitch tempo, <laughs> defensive shift frequency, <laughs> overall speed of teams with like, you know, the bags being bigger and the just overall rules that are probably going to increase stolen bases that they saw in the minors. Um, when the Guardians were ranked number one on win forecast rank um, with the rule changes. And that's not that's not used on real data, but that's just off projected data. So people are thinking um, the Guardians are going to be one of the best teams to, you know, make a bigger splash than they already have. It, it makes sense. You know, kind of go back to the points with, that we had already made. Uh, lowest strikeout percentage from last year, most of the same guys back this year and uh, again, barring something unforeseen, they're going to be a team that puts a ton of balls in play. Now you add in that you ban the shift and a uh, you know, majority of their left-handed bats, you know, Quan, uh, Jose Ramirez from the left side when he's facing a righty, Josh Naylor, um, the opportunities now for those guys to really come. Will Brennan, another name uh, for, for guys to, to, to keep track of as he's probably going to get some time at some point because he swings as good a bat as any of those young kids. Andre Semenis, as we know, is an all-star. So they've got a lot of ways. And Mikey, I know you kind of talked about it when, you know, you're making sort of those daily lineups of, wow, lefties against the righty. If you're, you know, stacking some Guardians bats, it's going to be even better this year because of the rule yeah. changes too. So something to think about it as you move forward. But it, it doesn't shock me, uh, really, Matty, that when when those projections kind of came out that, that they would be towards the top, if not the top team. Uh, all that being said, it's a whole different game your second time around, uh, you know, from your rookie year to your second year because the league is so good at adjusting. And, yeah. and that's probably the main challenge offensively, I think, the Guardians face uh, collectively because they have 
you know, almost half their lineup. You're, you're talking about uh, Quan. You're talking about Jimenez, Oscar Gonzalez. Uh, you know, if, if Brennan ends up finding a platoon, you know, role in there as well, they're going to have to deal probably with failure at some point. And it's a matter of can they shorten that duration of failure? And if yeah. they do, and, and the collective group does, then, man, the Guardians are good. They're going to be tough. And, and taking the homer hat off, you know, just being objective. When you've got a team that puts the ball in play as much as they do, think about teams, and you guys can go back and look at this. The last five to ten years, teams that have won the World Series or have gotten the World Series have traditionally been one of those lowest percentile teams that strikes out. They put the ball in play a ton. They force the defense to have to make a ton of plays. When you do that, good things can happen. And I think don't, the, the don't we know it. Don't we know it? Met fans. 2015 killed, right? World Series. He got killed yeah. by the Royals. That's yeah. literally why they lost. I mean, he knew literally. what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. He knew. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't strike anybody out. And, you know, they put the ball in play. And and Lucas Duda looked like yeah. a minor yeah. league, you know, first <laughs> day. at best. Uh, but yeah, no, you're right. And it's, uh, you know, put the ball in play is, you know, taught at such a young, like, level but it's almost like with the way the analytics were going with home run or strikeout was actually kind of taking over. This is going to be a nice, you know, breakup in what we've been seeing recently. And then hopefully it's good for the game of baseball. Um, I know they're doing it for more like the average fan, you know, duration watching, but as a guy who loves baseball, I used to watch baseball games with like the, the score book in my own, in my mm-hmm. own hand. It was like watching a 2007 Mets game that they were down 13 in, in May anyway. Um, but that's from guys like me. I don't really, I don't know if I love the rule changes, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Maybe it will. Maybe I'll change my mind. What do you think um, from talking to people around the league, from maybe talking to even players? What's the consensus that you've gotten about the rule changes? Are they happy? Or are they sad? Obviously, they have to deal with it, but what's been going on? Yeah, I think the majority of guys are, are very happy with it. And, you know, even just talking to defenders specifically in the infield. Uh, those guys, you can't really be a space cadet. You can't just look in the stands and be, you know, not locked into the action. I think uh, Isaiah kiner falefa had said it maybe a week or two uh, into camp and Yankees camp was like, this is awesome. Uh, yeah. I know there was a bench coach in the American League that was unnamed. It was like, whoever decided to put this in, put them in the Hall of Fame. Um, I, I think anyone would sign up for yeah. a, a shorter duration of games and higher scoring games that's that's what spring training showed us it was about 30 minutes off of the average game time for the regular season and it was about a run to a run and a half higher of of total runs scored so i I think major league baseball in the interim here in just three to four weeks has accomplished initially the goals that they want now let's see how this happens when games matter and Mm -hmm. when you see pitch violations or, or, or clock violations um, when, when you see those directly affect results, uh, you guys saw it. You know when the Red Sox game ended in early in camp on that pitch clock violation. That's it, oh, ball yeah. game. You know, does that end up happening in September that determines camp. the playoff spot? Yeah, or, you know, or, the, or the World Series or or something like. I mean, that can't happen. I, I don't know. Yeah, this... and and I I think you're right. And, and and the competition committee, I think, will take that. I I, I really believe there is a logical understanding and and an idea of okay, we're going to have to evolve a little bit. We're going to have to be flexible as we move forward. And the WBC might be the best example, the Otani Trout at bat. Every mm-hmm. single pitch would have been a pitch clock violation on Otani. Yeah. But you were so wrapped up. But nobody cared. <laughs> that's, the height of, that's, that's what you want. That's what you tune in for. And, and I, wonder, I wonder as we get into uh, maybe the latter part of the regular season, perhaps even – um, at the end, where we, we see the competition committee out and say, "All right, during the postseason, we're gonna we're, we're gonna be a little bit lax on this." Again, way down the line, but initially, rule changes. To answer your question, Maddie, is for the guys that I've talked to, everyone has said that it's kind of up their game a little bit because of the concentration, because of the lack of time in between action, and and that was the primary issue. Let's get everyone involved. Let's get everyone locked in. Not only not only player wise, but fan wise as well. Yeah. I mean, I hope, I hope so. I think it's just, it's, it's going to be tough when like, you know, you've been playing the the game a certain way, you're getting paid to play a game a certain way. And then kind of, you get, it's a big, it's a big mix. I hope everyone can respond. Well, I would hate to see some, you know, some people kind of not being able to get it as a pitcher to me, 
you know, I was never a pitcher. I could ask you this question. Thank God you're here. Um, if if I'm pitching and I'm focusing on the batter, and now there's a guy on base, and I have to worry about the pitch clock, and how many times have I thrown over? And not, <laughs> it's like yeah. that just makes it so much harder, in my opinion. Do you agree? Well, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I think you're probably aware a bit more, and and this is why I think MLB really wanted the onboarding process to happen from day one in spring training to have the maximum amount of time for guys to get acclimated to to what was going to happen, so that you could practice stuff, um, you know, during those games. You could understand, okay, wow, 15 seconds goes really fast uh, yeah. when when there's nobody on base. Oh, wow, 20 seconds isn't as fast or isn't as long as I thought it was. So I, I think you also see some creativity. I know some catchers have talked about wanting to throw down to first a little bit more so that, you know, you yeah. only get the two disengagements before that third one, you got to, you got to retire the runner or they get the extra 90 feet. I, I, again, we saw this when the shift happened early with Tampa and Joe Madden and everyone was ahead of their time. We're, we're going to see some iteration. We're going to see some creativity of, of being able to bend the rules or getting around them to create a competitive advantage. We don't know what that is yet, but I, I think guys understand the premise ultimately of why these things were implemented. And I've yet to hear really a, a loud group of people together say, this stinks, this sucks, this isn't good for the game. I think to a man, everyone has really been good about adapting. And I think ultimately the fan bases will appreciate the improvement overall in the product on the field. Yeah. So one thing we've seen kind of <clears throat> up here in Met spring training is, is how guys are starting to skirt the line or push the envelope and kind of gamesmanship on the mound. Scherzer has been holding until they call a timeout, right? You're allowed one timeout now. So when they step back in, he's ready to go and he throw, he pitches quick. He never resets himself, which is like, Great, kind of like a little gray area, or the opposite side of that is he's after the timeout, they step back in. Now he's holding to the last possible second because he knows they can't call a timeout again. He's making them uncomfortable, where to the point where they probably would have called the timeout, but they can't. And then he throws the pitch. So there's going to be a lot of that kind of gamesmanship going on where, where pitchers are going to skirt the line. Is there now, can you step off? As much as you want also, I haven't seen anything like that. I know throwing over is only twice, right? Can you step yeah. off the run as a pitcher as many times, or is that a limit also? Yeah, so only two disengagements, period. So and, okay, and that's overall. where that's that's where the strategy will probably be uh, you know, from a pitcher standpoint. And and I can appreciate where Scherzer's testing things out, you know, kind of the mad scientist there of you know, what can I do that uh, remember, you still gotta throw the pitch and you yeah. still gotta throw a strike. So easier said than done. Just ask Rick and Keel. He can tell you. But uh, I think there's there's something to uh, Max Scherzer's method of figuring out what works, what doesn't, what he's comfortable implementing. And, you know, imitation, uh, greatest uh, you know form of flattery, guys. Uh, you're going to see once someone figures out something, yeah, you'll see it. You'll see it kind of go viral. And and we, we've yet to see whether offensively, defensively, how guys do that, but, but either way, overall, um, I, I think guys are, are happy with, with what's happened so far. I wonder if there's going to be like a new, um, new job for like a catcher or like a team's homework on like analytical side. And it's like, you can now see how, how does this certain hitters do on the back end of a clock after they've already used the timeout and like almost add that to the arsenal of not yeah. only does this guy, you know, cause baseball is so analytical, like, you know, two strikes can't hit a you know slider away or you know whatever it is. I wonder if that's going to be added into the mix of almost yeah, like, like his batting average six seconds or longer is <laughs> where you know between two and four seconds he's hitting three fifty. So hold it longer on this guy. That. Yeah, hold it longer on this guy. Quick pitch this guy. This is you're right, Matt. There's a whole other analytical side that's going to be brought out here. Am I yeah, and. Great? Would you agree? No, yeah, you're right. And I, I was just even thinking of, uh, you know, that, that shot clock ID in the NBA um, where, you know, guys, you know, under 10 seconds, under five seconds, you know, where they're shooting percentage and, and forcing the defense to make a play. I'm also thinking as a former reliever of, okay, 
uh, and, and, you know, Mike, you're taking your idea of, of, we'll just say, you know, six seconds or less, the percentage that a guy steals. Cause yeah. then that, that impacts me. Cause I'm going to have clear sight on, on the side. Cause as a right hander, I'm going to see it over by the other dugout. I can see when that clock ticks down six, five, four, three, two, one. And if I already know the scouting report in my head of this guy, 10% of the time, you know, in a span of 50 times being on base, has gone or has attempted a steal, I'm more likely to probably go home and take my chances. Or yeah. if I know a guy's 50, 50, I mean, you're right. I, we are, we are paralysis by analysis sport as far as, <laughs> as far as these crazy stats go, but you're right. It opens up a whole nother plethora of, yeah. of things to analyze in those situations. I wonder if we'll see more pitch outs and things like you, you, you almost know this guy's going like you're, you're done with your disengagements. You're, you know, you got like an O2 count, maybe, could waste a pitch it per se, and you just kind of go with the pitch out because you know this guy's probably going. Well, not only that, that's another way the pitch clock can help the stolen the the runner is if you've thrown over twice already, and now the pitch clock, the guy from first is going to have the same view as a righty of the pitch clock. So he's it goes down three, two, one. He might take off because he knows you have to go home now. Yeah, you have or one get him. So you're, home. I think you're allowed to go get him, right? You can try to get it, but you have to get him or else it's. The yeah, the third yeah. one you have to pick him off, right? So he might take off. It's going to be like the three, two, two outs, head start kind of. Two that, seconds, that, he might just go. There might be, and and this will be really intriguing from a, uh, an individual base runner standpoint. You know, you're usually taught to focus on a part of the pitcher's body, depending on who they are. You know, it'll give you an, an automatic indicator if they're coming over or yeah. not, because. You know, if they try and balk, then you're obviously going to go up 90 feet. To be able to have the dual con uh, concentration of seeing that pitch clock out of the corner of your eye and still keeping concentration on the pitcher, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want that responsibility as a runner, but I, I get where the psyche would be. Like, if you're good enough to be able to have that kind of married together, yeah, you could exploit the system if you're that good. But it, it probably gives you an idea too. I'm gonna take an extra half step because he's got to get yeah. me. Um, right, you're taking a bigger yep. lead because you know he's got to go. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here. You may not even know the answer to this. I'm I may be thinking way too in depth here. But what if you try to pick him off? He goes and on the throw to the you know shortstop covering the bag, he jets back and beats it. You didn't get him. Is that a balk? Well, how does that work? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it's, it's the third time picking over. You didn't That's you didn't insane. record an out, so he's gone. Well, he, yeah, goes. He, he goes. Yep. So he moves up. So That's again, another crazy. another strategic thing or decision that you've got to make. And yeah, Tom Amansky somewhere is smiling on the uh, on the fundamental video of being able to do a rundown and execute it there. So yeah, yeah it's a, it's that's a whole another part of it. Yeah, that's gonna be. That's I'm. Um, thank you so much for helping us break this down because I already yeah. had so many questions where I was like, "This is gonna be." I, I feel bad for the guys out there just because, like, I'm already I'm gonna be watching it, thinking in my head, "You're gonna have so many people on Twitter, like the bots, like you should have done X, Y, Z." You're gonna see well, so you, many more. Do you remember <laughs> last year? Um, it was Houston. Kyle Tucker left early on purpose in order for them to challenge the play. Yes. So that the run counted from the previous play. Yep. Or I, yep. I, I I'm, it's kind of in that realm. I don't remember yeah. exactly what happened, but they challenged whoever they were, the Houston was playing, challenged that he left early, which he did on purpose. So they ruled him out, but then they couldn't challenge the previous play, whatever yeah. it was. And that's like gamesmanship of the replay that we learned <laughs> last year. So yep. it's going gonna, gonna to be something else along those lines is going to happen this season. It's just a matter of who the first guy to kind of do it is. Yeah, yeah, the old adage of uh, one guy's playing chess, everyone else is playing checkers. No yeah. question about it. Yeah. Um, well, we talked about that rule in depth. Um, I'm definitely going to highlight that on uh, on the recap of this video. Um, going into season predictions, I saw you post on Twitter. Um, I was I was kind of you know creeping on you a little bit. You posted your predictions for the each. Um, I guess the AL pennant and NL pennant. Um, Talk us through that. Why do you – you had some bold predictions there, if I do say so myself. Why don't you talk us through the thought process? Yeah, so uh, the National League was a bit more clear-cut for me this year, and uh, I, I, I've been a big fan of Atlanta. Uh, knowing what their roster is returning and, and the pedigree, even losing Dansby Swanson, just felt like depth-wise 
if if any team could be able to overcome any adversity thrown their way, it felt like Atlanta would be that team in that division. So uh, I sided with them to win the East uh, over the Mets and the Phillies. Uh, the Central, a bit more, was kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Milwaukee has the best staff, but their offense is really unpredictable. St. Louis is going to have a really, really good lineup. Uh, their rotation is probably going to be unpredictable. I just feel that when you look at how Milwaukee's been in the past, with that offense, and, and you guys know this if you've been betting on them, that offense can go into a rut and stay there for a long time. What happened to Christian Yellich? Time. What happened? I, and, I, and I think he'll bounce back. I think he'll actually be pretty good this year. And, and him and Willie Adamas at the top of that lineup would be pretty good. But I think St. Louis, from the depth of their offense and you know even adding Jordan Walker to the bottom of that lineup, I mean, that's an embarrassment of riches to have, you know, Donovan or Newt Barr, uh, Tommy Edmond, whoever you want at the top of that lineup in front of Goldschmidt and Arenado. You know, Tyler O'Neill is a, a great bounce back candidate. Dylan Carlson is going to be fantastic. They, there are just so many weapons in that lineup that they will probably be able to out hit their pitching woes if they have them. So I'll, I'll err on the side of the better offense there, knowing that John Mozeliak and that group could probably make a trade or two if they needed to to bolster the rotation. And I think they can outlast Milwaukee more than you know, Milwaukee is going to have to pitch for six straight months to be able to be really good with the balanced schedule. You can't beat up on the pirates anymore for 19 times. Can't beat up on the reds 19 times anymore. So I just air it on. I'll, I'll take St. Louis in the better lineup and, and think offensively they'll be able to out hit their competition. The West. And I think most people will see this this year. It's the most vulnerable the Dodgers have been probably in the last five to ten years. Easily. And that's not taking that's not taking anything away from them because they're still really no. good. <clears throat> but uh, this is this is the Padres. The Padres remind me of the LA Rams the year they won the Super Bowl. Yeah. They literally went they went all, all in. in. Yeah. Here, here's everything. We're going for it. And I, I, talent wise, it's the first time where they've been able to stack up at every position and and arguably be better at more of them than what they've been in the past against the Dodgers. The Dodgers rotation, too, is a huge question mark because you don't know about Kershaw if he's going to stay healthy all year. You don't know what you're getting out of Syndergaard. You're not getting Bueller back till after the All-Star break, most likely. Uh, Urias has had, you know, you know, nicks and bruises here and there. Uh, so we've gone through most of the rotation. You don't have Tony Gonsolin uh, to begin the season and no Tyler Anderson anymore. So, you know, that that's a serious blow to their depth. And what do they look like closing out games now that Kenley Jansen is in Boston? If it's Evan Phillips, it's a great option, but you still got to get there. You still got to define roles, and you can't hang out the bullpen to dry early in the year if your rotation is hurt or can't get deep in the games. So I think the Padres made the most sense as far as winning that division. I still think the Dodgers are good enough to make the playoffs. I really do. I think they'll be a wild card for me. I had, I think I had them as, as my number one wild card. I think I had the Mets uh, at number two. Uh, and I believe I had the Phillies uh, at number three again, if you guys can check me on that. But um, the National League felt a bit more clear cut uh, than the American League. American League side could be kind of a changing of the guard or it has the potential to be. As far as uh, division winners, um, I, I still think the Yankees, once they get healthy, will be able to outlast the Blue Jays. Albeit I have the Blue Jays winning the American League and I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, the mm -hmm. Guardians in the Central, just because I think, they, again, kind of that same idea. They have enough to outlast the Twins and the White Sox. And then same thing across the board. The Astros, uh, no Verlander this year, no Altuve for the first month or two. But they still have as deep a lineup and as great a pitching staff as anyone in the American League. Seattle yeah. is vastly improved. Love Seattle this year. I think they've got a really great shot to go a long way. But Yankees, Guardians, Astros might be a little bit of chalk there across the board. Wild card, uh, the Mariners were the number one wild card for me because I think they give, uh, along with Toronto, I think Toronto was my number two wild card. Um, I think both those teams individually give the Yankees and the Astros, respectively, their biggest challenge throughout the season. And then the Rays. I, I can't write off Kevin Cash to save my life. Uh, I mean, those guys find every single way to stay in a season and then yeah. – you know, get in and, and really cause havoc. They're not afraid to go into Yankee Stadium. They're not afraid to play anybody wherever they are. It's just a team that you hate to see late in the year because they're really fundamentally sound. They can beat you in the bullpen so many different ways, and they just grind you out as far as an offense goes. So 
I, I think the American League will be a little more balanced, maybe closer to the mean this year, not as ton of separation as maybe the National League might be. I agree. I think the Braves, I hate to say it, are obviously so good. I don't know how they're holding their players hostage and getting away with these contracts, but it, it is what it is. Um, all the power to them. Um, I think they you know, have a lot of young guys with a mix of vets. Um, it's a just I've, We saw it last year. Everyone's like, oh, the Mets choked the lead. Well, it's like the Braves won like 77% of their games down the stretch. Yeah. It's almost like we didn't – they didn't almost choke as much as the Braves just played out of their minds and unfortunately didn't – didn't come to, together in the playoffs, but um, as a regular season goes, if you know, and that was with Albies getting hurt, Acuna getting hurt, like they can withstand a lot of punches. Um, so I do agree with you. I think the, the trade deadline, like you said, in the the AL Central is going to be huge in the NL East with what Steve Cohen will do uh, with the whole Diaz injury. Will we get more relief help? Will we get whoever whoever's not making the cut? You know, does Francisco Alvarez? You know play well does Brett Beatty come in and start performing so there's a lot of unknowns in that as then in that aspect and I may be just saying that as a Mets you know homer that's kind of my homer hat that I'm wearing <laughs> um but it, it's gonna be a gauntlet of a uh, of a uh, division I think the Phillies are a tough team as well but Harper gone to the all-star break yeah Hoskins is, is a little banged up as well I may get more value on them a little bit more into the season kind of like they did last year yeah uh, but you can't count out them as well and at least is a gauntlet um I do like Almost everything you said, the Mariners are, you know, made the leap. The Blue Jays, um, you know, like I, I wouldn't say they're going to beat the Yankees, but it wouldn't shock me if they did. It's kind of like that, you know, mindset. It's like I could see it happening, but I don't know if I can can put it there yet. You had the stones to put it there. Um, but I love their team, a lot of young talent as well. So I'm, I like it. I think you could find a lot of futures bets from just your list on Twitter alone. Mike, yeah. I don't know if you want to add on to that at all. Like kind of basing off, off what you said, I kind of look at the – say MVP race, right? If we have Toronto giving the Yanks a real shot here, or maybe even winning division, it's going to be close. You look at Guerrero to win the AL MVP. If they're going to be in it, he's going to have a monster year. Same thing with Seattle. If they're going to give the Astros a run in the AL West and be the number one wild card, the number one wild card might have the second most wins in the American League. So that at that point, you look at Rodriguez as, as possible AL MVP situation. So there's a lot of ways that you can look at like division winner predictions where you'll see people, oh, they're not winning the division. All right, but it's a case that they can. And if they are, this should be the narrative that you might be able to pluck some individual players' futures bets from it. So based on your American League, I think Guerrero and and, uh, Julio as MVP candidates probably carry some value if that's the kind of narrative that the American League is going to go this year. And as as far as the, the National League, is this my Homer hat? Like if the Mets hang with these guys, I think Alonzo's probably going to have a monster year. He might be in the race for American League MVP. His numbers last year were right there with Goldschmidt as far as home runs and RBIs. So if the Mets do win the division or at least win a hundred games again, he's going to be right there, you know, uh, Lindor as well. It's kind of, they fed off each other last year. So based on your kind of analysis here of the division winners, like I said, you could probably get some, uh, NL AL MVP MVP looks or maybe some futures bets that way. Yeah, I would I would say the American League perhaps is 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 a, a two way street. You know, Otani is at what two to one? You know, to win it. You can't bet it, that. It, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, no. For for me, you're you're more likely like if he's going to be the MVP, then he's got a great shot at the Cy Young. So your value is is to bet the Cy Young straight out, and he's probably what 10, 12 to one to do yeah. that. But I, I think your other part of this is if you think the Angels stink this year and and they ultimately have to trade him, he's not going to have those last two months in an American League uniform if, you know, it, let's say that, you know, he doesn't get traded to the Mets or he doesn't get traded to the Dodgers. Yeah. Uh, if he's somewhere in the American League, which is hard to fathom, although the Yankees might, they might do it. They might pull out all the stops and say, forget it, we got to go. Uh, you, you would think that the Angels trade him out of the league and and somewhere to a contender in the National League. So to me, that's where I like, you know, the Jordan Alvarez's, the, the Vladimir Guerrero Jr.'s, Mike, as you talked about. If Toronto's going to be in that Jordan, running for a top. That's Maddie's guy. Yeah. That's Maddie's yeah, guy. I, I just, to me, that that's where, if you're looking at betting MVP futures for the AL, because Shohei is who he is, your your bet is basically against the Angels, you know, yeah. of being being a good team or being a playoff team. 
um, because they will then have to make the decision with it being Shohei's free agent year to trade him by the deadline. And if they do that, then it opens the door for those other guys. The National League is is going to be, you know, you can almost pick between four to six guys on two or three teams. If that, Mike, as you talked about, kind of if that narrative goes, whoever has those top two records, you know, if it's Atlanta, if the Mets, you know, end up, you know, just really putting it all together for four to five months. And, and if San Diego, you know, they're going to be battling themselves kind of with Soto, you know, with Machado, um, Bogarts. You know, uh, yeah, Bogarts. I mean, even Tatis. if Fernando Tatis comes and, back, yeah. You, and with the Phillies, if they're able to withstand this Harper injury and oh. hang in there and maybe win the division, it's going to be Trey Turner for them. Yeah. Yeah. MVP yeah. So yeah. And, and even if you want to take a long shot there on, on Schwarber for a guy that, mm-hmm. that is going to probably hit a, a chance to hit a ton of home runs there too. So, yeah, I, th- I think the American League is a two-way street. You know, you're, you're betting against the Angels, or if you think Otani's going to win, better off value-wise to try and take him to win the Cy Young Award because that means he's obviously going to be pitching, you know, as well as he's hitting. So I think that's, I think that's probably where you go from that standpoint. I almost wish you could, like, you could bet Otani to win AL MVP. No, because <laughs> the odds are almost right there anyway to where it'd be like it wouldn't be too crazy of a number, which everyone else it would be. Um, cause you're right. And even if like, it's, it's not even almost on Otani's performance. Like if Trout gets hurt, they're probably not making the playoffs and they're probably going to ship him out anyway, whether he's hitting a hundred home runs through May, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, it could be, I, that's a very good angle that I don't even think a lot of people will be aware of. Um, I will say this Otani, your thoughts on Otani. Is he the best player you've ever seen play baseball without a doubt? <laughs> Yeah, and, and if you guys haven't had a chance, it's the beauty of the balanced schedule now is, is everyone, every fan base is going to be able to see him, you know, every other year. And it, when you see him in person, uh, and I was out in Anaheim uh, calling games for the Guardians uh, at the end of April last year, it, 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 it's surreal. And, and you guys have seen Aaron Judge probably, you know, and, and the behemoth of a human being he is. You know, Otani, as far as his shoulder width, like he, he's just such a massive – human everything arms legs head everything is bigger you know than than you you humanly have seen in the flesh i don't think and, he's and human. Judge is huge. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah it, he's, it, it, it's not real it, it, and and the same can be said when you if, when you put otani and judge next to each other and then altuve or or even anybody else, put pete alonzo next to him because the polar bear is a big dude but it's it's just he's dwarfed he's dwarfed when you look at yeah. these guys and and yeah, I mean it's a simple yes. Uh, he is he is absolutely one hundred percent the best player I, I've ever seen. So he's the best player you've ever seen. Um, going to your pitching days, who is the best hitter you think you've ever faced? If you had to pick. Oh, uh, without yeah, without question, it's Manny Ramirez. Oh yeah, let me uh, get, we're, and I, we're getting I, ready for the for the playing days question. Yeah, call. yeah. Manny yeah, Ramirez was my yeah, favorite and, player back in the day. Here we go. Yep. Here <laughs> right, we go. A little cheap water. Now we're fired up. Yeah. 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 So, so Manny was uh, Manny was two for three against me with two homers and a strikeout. And uh, Got him. the the se- the second homer he hit off me was uh, I think it was game four of uh, the ALCS in 07. and it was an opposite field homer. It was a three two pitch. I think it was ninety six on the black because I I felt good that day. I had one of my best fastballs and and I was just chucking, and he just turned that sucker right around. He put his hands up in the air like it was a walk-off homer, and the Red Sox were still down by four after that. So uh, <laughs> it, it, he went. It felt like he went what 480 feet to right center. It was it was just a majestic blast. But uh, you know, Manny Manny was incredible. Uh, you know, I faced Ortiz. I don't think we're a uh, big poppy ever got a hit off me. Um, you know, Miguel Cabrera. I think is two for ten with two bombs off me um, and a few strikeouts. Uh, Kevin Euclid, ironically, you guys are New York guys, but uh, Euclid, I think, has a 714 career average against me. It didn't matter if I underhanded or overhanded it. Uh, Euclid was, was turning <laughs> around on me. So, uh, but yeah, strangest, it was one of the strangest batting stances you've ever seen, right? <laughs> threw you <laughs> yeah, off. It threw you off. Yeah. It, it, it just, up he that. put the ball. Yeah, he put the ball in everything. It, it, it was perplexing to try and, you know, find a hole there where you could try and get him. But yeah, uh, many by far. Um, the best there I've ever faced. What uh what would you say was like your best inning or your best performance? Like did you strike out the side against say three, four, five, or 
you know, a, a huge out in the playoffs or something like that? What was your, what was your kind of most memorable moment? Uh, unmistakably, game three, ALDS in Yankee Stadium. Uh, we were up two games to none. We were losing. I think we were losing three to one. It was the eighth inning. Um, I was warming up in the bullpen in the seventh. And, and traditionally, uh, Louis Isaac, who was our bullpen coach at that point, he has a big clipboard, and he would give us the first three guys that we were facing in the next inning. And for whatever reason, I, I had, had him tuned out. And, and I felt it was, a, it was an unseasonably warm night that night. I felt really good. It was some of my best stuff of the year. And I was just firing just, just cheese. And I did not hear him say, hey, you got Jeter, Abreu, and A-Rod. And so I'm just running in, and it's 62,000, you know, sold out there at Yankee, the old Yankee Stadium. And I'm firing to, Vic, to uh, Victor Martinez, uh, who's catching me. And I can just see these white teeth, you know, under the mask. Like he's just grinning at me like, Poppy, you got it tonight. Oh, you got it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> these are pretty good. And so uh, – But you then know, Jeter – yeah, then he throws down to second, and at that at that point in that season, Jeter's walk up song was "I Run New York" by Jay Z, and and so I remember catching the ball, I think from Casey Blake at third and turn around, I'm hearing it, and I'm like, oh my god, oh man! <laughs> I turn around, I see him walking in, and and the mound at Yankee Stadium, it was kind of it was kind of tremoring a little bit because it's sixty two thousand, you know. Yeah. This day and age, you only get. You know, 38, 45,000, it's just not – they don't build them that big right. anymore. And, um, yeah, so I struck out Jeter to start the inning. Uh, Bobby Abreu, uh, who at that point was, as you guys know, one of the best left-handed hitters of his time, uh, always took the first pitch. So I just poured in a strike uh, there because I it was a free strike. Uh, ended up getting him to strike out. And then so, you know, of course, I'm looking. I see A-Rod, you know. Big, big guy and all just, just getting in there. And I'm like, okay. So then it hit another level of adrenaline and I'm just, I'm just firing pellets, man. Uh, ended up hanging a slider that he should have hit to kingdom come, but he ended up fouling it straight back for strike two. And then I, I blew some cheese by him uh, to end that inning. So yeah, punched out Jeter, Abreu, and A-Rod. Easily my best inning ever. Uh, I, awesome. I was 20, I was 23. It was my rookie year, guys. I came in the dugout and Paul Byrne and Jason Michaels, you know, two of our veteran guys on, on that team, they're watching me walking the whole time. I go over to the bench. I sit down, you know, down at the end of the corner. And they both come over and they're like, you know what you just did? You know what you just did? <laughs> like, yeah, I got three outs. I'm like, no, you struck out a future Hall of Famer, maybe two future Hall of Famers, and probably the best right handed hitter in the game right now. You know what you just did? In the Yankees Pretty good. Pretty good. Yankee on the road, yeah. yeah. In a playoff game. Yeah, so I came into the – to we, we ended up losing that game, but we won game four uh, to clinch a series. But after that game, I came in, and, God, I mean, these were still – I think this is back when we had the Razor phones, you know, the, the thin the thin yeah. cell phones. Flip. And, yeah. you know, you're, 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 you're pressing the button like three times to get to the right letter to text or whatever. And uh, well, I, I forgot like, about that. Could you imagine like that now? 70, 80 text messages, like 20, 30 calls from people. Uh, it was surreal. It really was. But yeah, that was easily, easily the best inning of my life. No question well, about it. Was that kind of like a, oh, I belong here moment? Like you're kind of like, can you, can you get there? And that was like a. I think my belong there moment was probably the night of my first major league win. That was at home uh, against the Detroit Tigers. And I think I had, I think I had three innings of relief. That was, that was back in, and, and CC Sabathia was our ace that year. He won the Cy Young. That was against Verlander when Verlander was, you know, in his prime with Detroit. Still crazy. He won I think, the Cy Young. <laughs> I think he won. I think we hit three or four solo homers off Verlander that night. CC was up in his pitch count. I was the most rested guy. And so I came in, I pitched a sixth, seventh and the eighth. Um, and I ended up punching out Gary Sheffield to, I think, end my third inning. And I remember just fist pumping like all hell and, and, and Victor <laughs> did too coming in. And I, I mean, it was, it was a big moment. I, I knew I had thrown the ball well, but Chef was that last guy. And I'm like, I, I don't, I don't care if I get to get a running start. I am just blowing this by you. And, uh, and I did. And I remember coming in 
after that and sit with Victor and he kind of put his arm around me like, oh boy, you know, and, and <laughs> he's like, I'm here you know, to, ha- to, to have an all-star do that, you know, your rookie year, you're like, okay, all right, now, now, now I belong. Uh, I did the post game interview. I got the pie in my face, uh, you know, on TV and you get the beer shower coming in and all that for your first big league W. So yeah, I was, I think, I think that was it. So many memories, my rookie year guys, it, it it felt like I, I slept 30 hours, you know, for, for all three months that I, that I was up there. So uh, definitely the, uh, definitely the moment that, that, that sticks out is, yep. Yep. I made it. Well, that was, that was great. Is there on the flip end, we're going to do this too. Was there a, what am I doing here moment when you yeah. first got there <laughs> yeah. and you're like, Oh man, this is real. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> my rookie baseball card has the picture of when I recorded my first major league error. So it's literally me finishing the throw to first base. I think it was against the Rangers at home. And I remember it clear as day because I just short hopped it to Ryan Garko who was our first baseman. And I, it ended up allowing the go ahead run to come in. And I remember being there like, did that just happen? Did I just do that? Like it felt like an idiot. And I'm like, I've made this play a thousand times. Like what the hell just happened? I just uh, struck out Gary Sheffield all- for crying out loud. I can't even throw the ball to first base. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. And and so I came I came in the dugout and I like you just felt dirty. Like, ugh, like I can't believe I just did that. But what was funny is those rookie cards came out that off season and uh, the guy from Tops, whoever came in, I looked at him like, I can tell you exactly when this happened. When this was. is my first big league error. This is crazy. <laughs> That's, that's wild. That's insane. Yes. I, I always feel like when you get, if that was me, I wouldn't want to look at anyone in the dugout. I'd be like, you know what? <laughs> yeah. Or just like in the bullpen, just I'm just gonna put my head down and just, you know, that didn't happen. Well, you know, when you've lost the game, if you're the losing pitcher, you usually just get pats on the back at your locker. There's no music going to the locker room or anything like that. Guy, hey, no, hey, don't worry about it. You're all right, you're all right. And you just feel awkward. It's like, sorry, sorry, I lost the <laughs> <Yeah>. game. <laughs> This it's, one's on me, just, fellas. It's yeah, on me. just one of those, one of those Got weird next things. Time. And then, you know, the media will ask you three or four different ways. You know, what happened out there? Well, obviously, I threw the ball in the right field and we lost. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll try to do better <laughs> next time. I threw the ball not where I was supposed to. <laughs> that's, <laughs> Crazy, that's ridiculous. So, me and Maddie were talking about this before uh, you had come on. One of the more infamous Yankee um, situations, if you will, was the. Jabba, Jabba Chamberlain Bugs, and that was in Cleveland. Were you on the team there? In the in now was that the playoffs? The end of the regular season? Yeah, that was the playoffs. That was Game was, Two yeah. of uh, the division series. And you know, what was weird about it was at that moment uh, we were out in the bullpen in center field, and all the midges were real concentrated on that part of the infield. So Grady Sizemore. Uh, you know, when he eventually came out um, to play defense after that inning, we asked him, like, what in the hell happened? Because we didn't have any monitors out there. We didn't know what was going on. And he was like, dude, there's just a bunch of bugs. This crazy. And <laughs> that without happened before. No, I mean, I can't really like from was... when I was there. Yeah, when I was there, um, I, I had never I never seen that happen in a game, let alone, you know, been around um in that park if it had happened before but either way if that doesn't happen there's no chance we win that game because of how java had been pitching and Mm -hmm. you know obviously mariana was in after that yeah yeah well we thank lake erie we thank lake erie for their contributions (laughs) uh for for that day because uh that allowed us to to you know get that tying run and then eventually walk it off in extra innings so craziest most random you can't make this up scenario um, and it ended up being a perfect time for us. It, it's just God being on your side. You know what? We don't want it is. to win this. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is divine the intervention. <laughs> that, that's yeah. literally what happened. Um, Mike, any other questions for Jensen before we wrap things up? We've taken a lot of time from him. Uh, we appreciate yeah, no, you being I, here. I think this was great. Appreciate you coming on. Maybe uh, throughout the season, you could hop back on and kind of see how, how the season's playing out. And uh, when we do see maybe some – some pushing of the envelope with these new rules. It'd be cool to kind of talk to you about it. 
if you wanted to come on. Anytime. Yeah. Hey, thanks for reaching out, guys. Uh, exciting uh, to, to follow you and, and uh, you know, hear your insights as well. And uh, look forward to being on with you again very soon. Yeah. Awesome. Um, like I said, we're going to judge uh, Jens on some of his SGPs he has to build uh, throughout yeah. the season. We're going to keep it tab. <laughs> We're going to keep it tab like it. and see what he's got to do. Uh, but, yes, thank you so much again for coming on. We'll definitely come again in a couple months and talk about if what we said had anything to do, if it was right or wrong or adjustments being made. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, like, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks again for tuning in.